Mendelian genetics is always the first thing to learn in a course like this because that's the simplest possible form of inheritance. We've already seen a slight modification of that when we looked at sex linkage, genes that are just on the X chromosome. But now we're going to turn to what are now called non-Mendelian genetic traits. Now, just to remind you, Mendelian genetics, the important contribution of Mendel, are in these two things. First is his law of segregation. So each individual possesses a pair of alleles that are segregated during reproduction. Each sex cell only contains one allele. So he got that we're diploid, that our genes had homologous partners, but these are separated in meiosis. Secondly was the law of independent assortment. So if you're tracking two traits at a time, the inheritance of one trait does not affect the inheritance of a second trait, okay, if they're far enough apart now that we know about chromosomes. So those traits are passed on independently. Now, Mendel, this is all he knew, okay, because his experiments on his peas happened to include a very limited number of traits. They were unlinked, so they weren't passed on in tandem. There really was independent assortment of wrinkled versus green versus tall and all that stuff. Each trait he looked, like, he looked at actually only had two alternative alleles, either tall or short, green or yellow, wrinkled or smooth. And it was one locus, one trait. There was one gene that controlled whether the pea was wrinkled. There was one gene that determined how tall the plant was. There was one gene that determined whether it had a purple flower. Okay? So that's a single locus trait. Now, we know that genetics is far more complicated than that. And the first thing I want to get you familiar with is the fact that there can be multiple alleles. In diploid organisms, each individual can only possess two alleles in any given locus. So we got our homologous partners on chromosome 21, let's say. So we got the genes on chromosome 21 from mom and, and that from dad. Okay? So you've only got the two alternative alleles at that locus. But within a population, there can be many more than just two alleles. For, say, the immune system, I may have two particular alleles that protect me against certain diseases, but other people that you know may have very different alleles at those same loci. So the population can have far more alleles than are possible to be possessed by any one individual. So, for example, let's look at blood type. You may be familiar with type A, type B, type AB, type O. Okay, those are our four possible different blood types in the population. And it turns out that these are due to three different alleles. Okay? Now, if you're type A, that means you're either homozygote for this I super A, so both alleles are the same, or you're heterozygote between that and the recessive allele, little i. Likewise, if your blood type is B, maybe homozygous or heterozygous with at least one copy of the B allele. People who are type AB, they have one A allele and one B allele. And if they have the recessive and they're homozygous for the recessive, then they're type O. Okay? So this is where we can have, when you have this kind of variability in a population, some of the earliest paternity tests were based on blood type. So let's say we have a couple, and there's a child, and the mother is type O. So she's homozygote recessive, little i. Her husband comes in, and he's type AB, okay? And the child is also type O, okay? And so, you know, there's a question there if he's really the father, okay? And there are many, many more alleles and genetic markers that we use these days for paternity testing. But this is one of the very first ones that was in general use. The other thing that we find in genetics, it's very common, is 
that we have what's called polygenic inheritance. It turns out a lot of traits we're interested in. Most traits, in fact, are controlled by a number of different genes. And those genes are involved in very complex interactions. And there's two terms here I want you to remember, and that is quantitative traits, and then this really ugly word, pleiotropy. So quantitative traits. First is where we have multiple different loci influencing the same trait, okay? And with a quantitative trait, you have each allele shows incomplete dominance. So already this is going to be like snapdragons rather than pea pods. So you've got incomplete dominance, the heterozygote somewhere in the middle between the two homozygotes, okay? But we're going to have multiple loci that all contribute to some trait. And a well-known quantitative trait is height. Here's a bunch of uh, American soldiers that were lined up according to height uh, back, I think this is before World War I or maybe even during the Civil War. And you get a familiar bell-shaped curve where most people have average height. And then further away you get from that typical height, the fewer you have. So there's only a few very tall or very short individuals. So this is the bell-shaped curve. Most people during this time were 67 inches tall, so five foot seven, and very few people that were six foot three, and very few people that were less than about four foot ten. Okay? The important thing is that we see this continuation, a very smooth distribution of heights in the population, okay, with a peak in the middle. Now, let's just take a very simple two locus trait and will allow coloration um, as we did for snapdragons, but both of these two loci have alternative alleles and there's incomplete dominance, okay? So we have two loci contributing to the same phenotypic trait. Both show incomplete dominance, so they're like snapdragons. And if we cross two double heterozygotes, okay, we get four possibilities in the gametes here where it has a double dominant, a single dominant on A, a single dominant on B, and then a double recessive, okay? And so depending on the number of dominant alleles at these two different loci, you could have as many as four dominant alleles, and then you'd be very dark, or you might have all four recessive alleles and thus be very, very light. And so in this case, with two loci, and each one contributing incrementally to coloration, in the F2, we get our phenotypic frequencies of one, very dark, four, slightly lighter, six, average coloration, four, quite light, and then one, very, very pale. So that bell-shaped curve, one to four to six to one, like that, okay? And that's what you get if you cross two double heterozygotes and you have this incomplete dominance, both affecting the same trait. If we had three loci, then you go, you have 64 possibilities. And again, the most common thing is the average. And so here is a bell curve on a three locus model for skin color. And it turns out traits like height and skin color are influenced by genes at multiple loci, probably even more than three or four. The other main complication to genetics is called pleiotropy. And this is where you just have one locus, but this one locus affects multiple phenotypic traits. A good example of this is in house cats, where a single allele causes white hair and deafness in cats. So if this cat's homozygous for this particular allele, it's got white hair and it can't hear a thing. The EDAR allele is a single gene in humans that causes thick hair, an increased number of sweat glands, prominent teeth, and reduced breast size in East Asians. Another example of pleiotropy that we've seen earlier in the course in humans is to do with sickle cell anemia. This is a point mutation in one hemoglobin, and this causes the cells to be sickled rather than hockey puck shaped, 
and it has all kinds of effects on the blood cells themselves and on your circulation. In the end, it can impair mental function, paralysis, increased risks of pneumonia, rheumatism, and kidney failure, all of these just from that one point mutation. So that's a lot of different phenotypic effects with one underlying cause. So you have five apparently unrelated pathologies caused by one point mutation, that is pleiotropy. Now, finally, as a simplification, I've always just talked about a locus that codes for a particular trait. So phenotype equals genotype. But we know that that's an oversimplification almost every time. Phenotype, the physical characteristics of our body, are the result not only of genotype, but also the environment in which we live and in which we grew up. And this is the classic conflict in people's understanding of who we are and how we came that way in terms of individuals between nature and nurture. Are we mostly tall? Do we have darker skin? Are we uh, uh, frightened of loud noises in the dark? Is that our genotype? Or is that the environment we grew up in? And the combination of the two is always the case. This is really clear if we start looking at things as simple as plants. Here is a, a species of aquatic plant where the leaves grow a very different shape depending on whether they're above or below the water line. Above the water line, they're spatulate. They're getting a lot of photosynthesis coming in. Below the surface of the water, they're quite spindly, very different. And that's purely because it's the same genes, but below water and above water. Siamese cats. Any of you have a cat at home? This is a fun little experiment, but you didn't get it from me. See the coloration on their fur? And that nice dark nose and the dark paws, dark ears? Okay, that's because the pigmentation in the Siamese cat is temperature sensitive. And so those parts of their body that are cooler during the growth of the hair are darker. Okay? And you could, but you didn't hear this from me, Try this at home yourself, kids. If you shaved your Siamese cat, okay, completely, and then gave it a nice vest to wear, underneath its vest will stay nice and warm and the hair will grow out white. But everywhere else, especially if you were to shave your poor cat in cold weather, it would be cold and it would all grow out dark, a very different pattern than we usually see. So this is genotype. There is a gene cause this pigment to be produced in this breed of cat, but it's the environment that determines the distribution of the coloration over the surface of its body. Now, when we think about these kinds of interactions of phenotype and genotype, sometimes it's easy to get a bit frightened. So, for example, we know that there are some mutations on chromosomes number 13 and 17 that can greatly increase a woman's chances of getting breast cancer and increase the risk by between 12 to 60 percent. So BRCA2 is over here on chromosome 13, BRCA1 is here on chromosome 17. Now that's the genotype, but the environment that a woman creates for her body will have a really powerful effect on her risks from actually developing cancer given her genotype. So for example, drinking alcohol can increase risk by 7%. But exercise can reduce those risks by 30 to 40%. So although we often think of our genes as being our destiny, we can't help but being certain ways because well, at least hair color and eye color, that's genetic. But a lot of things in our lives, it turns out we do have more control over than we appreciate. And so in thinking about our phenotype as being the product of genotype and environment is a very strong kind of argument for leading healthy, active lives.